Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Kelsey Cavadas and I'm a Pelvic Health OT um, and also the creator of the Pelvic Health blog series. Um, I want to thank you so much for joining me on this mini-series as we dive into uh, what Pelvic Health is all about. So a little bit about me. Um, I live in Kansas with my husband and two dogs. I have worked in pelvic health for almost a year. It feels like longer. Um, and I've worked as an OT for just over two years. Uh, I enjoy getting outside with my dogs. We go paddle boarding a lot. Um, and I also love crafting on my Cricut. Um, I really wanted to create this mini series to provide an opportunity for students and other providers to learn more about pelvic health. Um, because when I first kind of jumped into this, I didn't really know where to begin. Um, and a lot of those continuing education classes were really costly. So it's kind of a gamble in the beginning. I wasn't sure, like, is this for me? I don't know, um, but kind of just went with it. And fortunately, I fell in love with it. So I hope that this short series will help keep some of those gray areas um, at bay and help you learn more about this amazing uh, specialty and hopefully help you decide what you want to do and if nothing else maybe just gain a little bit of insight into what we can do as OTs. So our learning objectives today will be um, describing the role of occupational therapy in pelvic health, uh, describing how to get into the specialty of pelvic health, and we're also going to touch a little bit on the biopsychosocial model and how it's relevant in pelvic health. So, what is pelvic health? The million dollar question. Um, it is the evaluation and treatment of pelvic floor dysfunction, a holistic and conservative treatment of pelvic floor dysfunction, and it's most importantly, the promotion of optimal functioning of all systems in the pelvis and beyond. So I really want to stress that pelvic health is a full body approach, um, especially as OTs. We really take a look at, at everything. I mean, it can be um, the mind, the body, you name it. Um, we're looking at the person from head to toe, how their posture affects their, um, their pelvic health, what are their daily routines. Um, so it really is a holistic approach, or it should be. So what are our relevant settings um, for pelvic health? You can work an outpatient, inpatient acute, inpatient rehab, home health, pediatrics, think you get where I'm going with this. You can work in all settings and still um, touch on all things pelvic health. So it's important to realize that we can address pelvic health no matter what setting that we're working in. So I currently PRN in um, an inpatient setting, so it has acute and inpatient rehab. And I discuss pelvic health quite often. Um, in the hospital, we have so many people who are on Foley catheters. So what does life after that look like? Um, things to look out for, when to be concerned, um, that sort of thing. I also PRN in a home health um, setting, and I end up chatting quite a bit about public health at eval, just asking about people's toileting routines, their bowel and bladder routines. Um, are they having trouble in any of these areas? A lot of times I'll see in the notes from the hospital that it's just kind of a side note, um, urinary incontinence or urinary urgency or something like that. And so a lot of times I'll just ask, how's that going? Um, any, any, has that worsened since you've been home from the hospital? Is that something that you'd like to address? Um, kind of going from there. Um, and then I used to work in long-term care, which had an independent and assisted living attached to it. And I really do wish that I knew more about um, pelvic health back then because I think I really could have helped um, our nursing staff develop better bowel and bladder programs for our residents. And then also just nipping it in the bud when some of our independent living or assisted living folks were starting to have difficulties with this. What could we have done to help kind of ensure that they don't end up on the long-term care side? Because as we know, that's a big reason a lot of people do end up in long-term care is continence issues. So I think that no matter what setting you're in, having this knowledge can be beneficial to you. So OT or PT or both. Um, I think that it's important that we have both disciplines working in this setting. There's so much to go around. 
Um, so traditional pelvic health may follow more of that biomechanical model, um, which includes exercise, manual therapies, maybe some modalities, uh, just a little bit more of that physical piece. Um, so I think, and I think most people would agree, that pelvic health needs a holistic approach. So that's going to include our ADLs, our IADLs, our mental health, our exercise, our manual therapy, our modalities, it all comes together here in this setting. And so it's very important that um, that we address all of those things. And I think as OTs, we are trained in a very specific way that we can address all of those things, um, especially that mental health aspect. And I think that's the biggest thing that is missing from that traditional um biomechanical model because that is based more in that exercise component. So I think this is where we're able to kind of tie everything together because we're, we're capable and we're trained to do both. We can handle the biomechanical aspect, but we can also address some of the more um, mental health and things like that while incorporating the person's roles and routines and the things they want to do and need to do. So now we've got our biopsychosocial model. So what is it? Um, it examines how the biological, psychological, and social aspects of a person intersect, how they all come together. And I think it's a really, it's a really OT model. Um, it accounts for the emotional aspect of, of the person and, and what that looks like. So in pelvic health, so many times I will see maybe one of my new moms who also has two other kids that are maybe under the age of six. Um, so she's exhausted, she's tearful, she's just drained, um, and now she's leaking on her way to the bathroom or when she's chasing her kids or maybe when she finally has the energy to play with them, she's having more and more accidents and the stresses are out and now she's having pain with intercourse and, and it's all just piling, piling, piling. We do need to address that and address her nervous system and, and that emotional aspect um, and the biopsychosocial model does a good job of encompassing it. And then also the physical, so thinking about that new mom I was just talking about, um, how, how is her posture, how's her physical appearance, how's her physical body, if she slouched over breastfeeding all day, what is that doing? It's causing back pain, it's causing more pressure down in her pelvic floor, um, just what's her physical body doing and how can we help support that spiritual, so what are their, their beliefs, their thoughts, um, all of that, and how does that impact our pelvic health, so... Um, sexual health, for example, there's a lot of people, everybody has different thoughts and beliefs and, and how do those impact our ability to engage in sexual health and are we able to communicate that and, and what can that look like? And that ties a lot into our emotional experiences as well. Mental health, um, do they have any history of trauma? What are their support systems? Um, like I said, you're going to hit it from all angles and I, I love that the biopsychosocial model really does encompass that. Um, so really, we're going for a holistic approach to treatment. Um, so as OTs, we're looking at roles, routines, and habits. And when we tie that into this biopsychosocial model, we're looking at the emotional, the spiritual, um, the physical, and the mental, and how all of those things impact our roles, routines, and our habits. And what can we help tweak? What can we do to support these people? So... Really, this is our bread and butter as OTs, this biopsychosocial model. This is what sets us apart from all other disciplines, and this is why we are so well-equipped to handle pelvic health and to work in pelvic health. The role for OT. So how do we fit into pelvic health? Uh, I do kind of a mini occupational profile with people. I don't ever pull out that AOTA sheet and start filling it in. It's just more of a conversation, but I do want to know what are their barriers, what are their supports, um, and how can we modify, tweak things to create a more a supportive environment. Um, how, do, how do we do that with them, and, and how do they advocate for their needs and things like that? So um, whether it be family life, work-life balance, how, how do we... How do we change that? And then looking at our ADLs. So what ADLs are involved in pelvic health? Toileting, dressing, sexual health, and so many more. So toileting, do they have a toilet available? So thinking back to my healthcare worker patients, um, 
my nurses who have a bunch of patients that they're seeing um, working 10, 12-hour shifts, are they able to even go pee every three to four hours? Most of them not. They're like, oh, I can hold it for six or more hours. I'm like, girl, that is not healthy. So we need to figure that out. Um, dressing, thinking some of my, my older patients, they're able to get to the toilet, sure, but when they get there, they're fumbling around with their buttons and trying to get things undone, and that's when they have most of their accidents. Um, sexual health, just talking through that. What are their barriers? What are their supports? If they're having pain with, with intercourse in, at any phase, um, have they talked to their partner about that? Are they open about that? And what are they wanting to do to change that? Um, creating a space for safe touch. Have they had trauma? Um, just kind of seeing what their unique needs are. Uh, and so many more. So as we know, pretty much everything in that OTPF, we could, we could connect to pelvic health in some way. So I think just knowing so many things are in our scope of practice and just taking all of that knowledge and piecing it together with our patient population is what's going to help solidify our role as OTs in this setting. So now that brings us to how do we get into pelvic health. Um, for me, it was kind of a um, a long way around. I started in skilled nursing, um, and I wasn't really loving it. It wasn't really my thing, and, and that's okay. I was PRNing at a, a larger hospital system that I now work for full-time, and they had an opening, and the, and the job listing was specific for a pelvic health OT. Um, there was an OT who kind of built the program, and she had to move on, um, and there's a few CODAs that worked in it and really were a huge support to developing that program, and I felt an immense support from um, our managers and things. So fortunately, since I already worked for the hospital, I had access to speak to some of those managers and kind of see was this a good fit or not? And so we set it up and I was able to shadow for a day. Um, so I would encourage you to pursue those kinds of opportunities if you can find them, um, just to see what, what goes on behind that closed door. Uh, for me, I think what sold it was just the outcomes and it was such a fast turnaround and hearing where these patients started and where they were ending was like night and day um, and the buy-in was so there they were so ready for change so many of them um, and then just hearing the therapist stories about these patients journeys and things that really that was it I was I was sold so um, fortunately I interviewed and got the job and the rest is history um, but for other options to get into into this field I think a lot of it's going to come from from advocating for ourselves which kind of brings us to our next slide so advocacy is huge in occupational therapy, and when we're talking about OTs getting into pelvic health, it's going to take a lot of advocacy. It's still it's still a newer thing, um, but I want to stress to you that while you're advocating for yourself in this role, you know more than you think you do. You went to school for a long time to get to where you are, and while your OT or OTA program may have not touched on pelvic health things specifically, um, you do have the skills to kind of do that, that interview and get to know the patient, figure out their supports, their barriers, all of these different things. Um, and even just having these conversations, asking these questions, most providers aren't even getting into any of that. They're going to tell you things that they've never told a soul, maybe not their doctor, maybe not their partner, um, no one. So you know more than you think you do, and you need to trust that and, and advocate for yourself in this role. And then also taking time to consider your setting. Where do you work? Um, because as we discussed earlier, no matter what setting you're working in, there is a role for pelvic health. Um, so just knowing, so skilled nursing, for example, like I said, I wish I would have known some of these things to help support that. Um, as you get this knowledge, I think it's important to advocate for your role in that. So becoming uh, the go-to for developing bowel and bladder routines and helping our nurses be, feel more supported in developing that and bringing up the quality of care for our residents. So it's it's your job to advocate for that. And so telling your director, hey, I've got these skills. Hey, OT can do this. We can handle this. Um, let's, let's get those referrals in. Let's get people seen. Let's help them. So just knowing where your little niche in your setting is going to be um, and really, really advocating for that. 
So, of course, you're also going to be taking continuing education courses. Um, there are quite a few options out there, um, some taught by OTs, some taught by PTs. So these are a few um, that I've taken. So I've taken two by the functional pelvis. Lindsay Vestal does an amazing job giving that, uh, that OT perspective. So I've done OT Pioneers and also her OT Elevate, which is her colorectal course. Um, and it was really refreshing to get that OT perspective uh, as you're kind of learning what pelvic health is all about. Uh, next is Herman and Wallace. They're well known. They've been around for a long time. Pretty much all of their staff are physical therapists. They have a class for anything you can think of. I've taken their pelvic floor one and two A courses. Um, learned a lot. Um, like I said, they've got a million and one topics, so definitely good to um, gain a better perspective on all things pelvic health. The Institute for Birth Healing, I really cannot say enough good things about Lynn Schulte. My goodness, she's like the most OTPT I've ever seen. Like she just, I love hearing the way she teaches and the way she explains things. It is so holistic. I think I've taken almost every online course she offers and will be taking a live course from her later this year. So very excited for that. I encourage you to check out her website. Uh, core exercise solutions. Sarah Duvall does a great job with that exercise component. Um, so if you want more of that, that biomechanical model and learning how to heal through exercise, she does a phenomenal job kind of making it very digestible and also does a great job explaining how the anatomy relates and, and some of those psychosocial factors too. She really does a good job with that. So I'd encourage you to check out all of these resources. There's also great um, OTs for Pelvic Health Facebook group that Lindsay Vestal leads um, and it's a huge, huge resource I post on there quite often asking questions and things. So definitely check all that out. So next that brings us to, um, is there a certification required to become a pelvic health therapist? And there definitely is not. Nope, no certification required. Um, as long as you feel competent in your skills and competent in your ability to, um, to treat this population as you would any other, um, you are qualified. So um, there are certifications out there, like there's Herman and Wallace's PRPC, which I will be planning to take that exam later this year. Um, but you certainly don't have to. It's just more personal preference, I think, above all else. So don't feel like you have to go get certified in anything. Just trust your skills. Um, get the knowledge that you feel like you need to, to best suit this patient population um, and go from there. So closing thoughts. Um, OTs definitely have a place at this table. Uh, we are well equipped, equipped to work in pelvic health. And we need more OTs in this space, so I'm so glad that you are taking the time to kind of listen through these webinars and these mini-series, and I really hope that you get a lot out of it. Um, so what are things you can do today to help uh, solidify the role of OTs in pelvic health? You can start advocating, so just telling anyone who will listen, yes, OTs, pelvic health. Um, I think pelvic health in general needs more advocacy and needs more awareness, and I think it's starting to build, but I think anything we can do to help push it in that direction. Um, getting involved in research, I think that there's there's more research that needs to be done right now. All of the pelvic health research is pretty much physical therapists, which is great that that research is there, but we need some OTs in there. So if you have that ability, please get involved. Um, and lastly, tell people you're an OT. So I feel like it's kind of a drag to constantly be correcting, but I think it's important just as an advocacy thing. We are OTs, we're proud to be OTs, and, and people need to know what that means and what that is, um, especially in this setting because it is a very PT-dominant um, field. So I think just, just getting that out and saying, yes, I'm an occupational therapist, and yes, I can do pelvic health. So questions, comments, anything, please email me at thepelvichealth.ot at gmail.com or send me a DM on Instagram at the pelvic underscore OT. I do plan to do one last video at the end of this mini-series that kind of just talks through questions and, and things that people have. Um, so if any of that comes up for you, please feel free to reach out. I love to talk to other clinicians, and I love to learn from other clinicians. So please share your thoughts. Um, and yeah, I'll see you guys next week as we jump into some anatomy. Thanks so much.